Sam Shaw opens one eye and tries to focus. It might be morning, but he isn't sure. He is sure he's got a bad crick in his neck. Sleeping face down on the empty bed frame was not a good idea. A faded blue tattoo of Beethoven twitches across his back. He turns over slowly and looks around at the peeling wallpaper, the cardboard stuck in the window, and the lonely light bulb in the middle of the ceiling. Christ, he says. He takes a deep breath and remembers where he is. He pulls his coat around him and sits up slowly. He picks up the empty bottle of scotch at his feet and creaks downstairs. Halfway through his cup of tea, he looks around at the neglected kitchen. This was his first trip home in many years, and he wonders if it was a good idea. He arrived as the only passenger on the last bus up the valley the night before, a Friday. There was nothing to see but dark, wet streaks across the windows. The town of Pengard was never much to talk about, even in the good times before his parents died and left him the house, before his army days, before his wild years, as he called them. Pengard is at the end of the line before you reach the Brecon Beacons. People come to look and wonder, but always move on quickly up the mountain to something more seemly. The pit head is gone, the high street is half boarded, and the flagstones are broken. This tired town is crumbling back to form the quarries of its birth. With a couple of exceptions, the people are crumbling too, head bowed and grey skinned against the sloping streets of wind and rain. The start of every weekend is always two buckets wetter and three coats colder than anywhere off the mountain, they say. But that has never stopped the local cherubs with their short skirts and stilettos and the boys with the brand new T-shirts and trainers, summer or winter, roaming the town looking for laughs and kebabs and a shag to finish. The valley youth marching together for a grand tour of abuse and blood and falling down and a good time had by all, if only they could remember. And in the thick of it is Billy Michael, a shaven-headed 25-year-old tattooed with valley boy and lover and I'll fight you till I die, and earring twice to finish. Billy likes to drink his usual several pints and wait for all comers in the middle of the square. This is his theatre. The high-heeled girls sidestep the vomit and chicken boxes and stand in corners, fagging and screaming encouragement as the boys roll and bite and cuddle each other in the red-soaked rain, fingerings flashing under the neon and the steam. And Billy holds vicious court to his left, his right, with boot and knee, and he smiles all the time, almost singing, as he drops one more soul down to the gutter to finish with a quick crack-tap from his head a kind of badge of ownership to the cheekbone of another unfortunate hoping to make his name as he's welcomed to Billy's Friday night Valley Carnival Stop Tap Jamboree. The Clarion is a barn of a place on the town square. In the past, it was the pride of top-hatted steelmen and coal magnates, a grand palace built for congregation and education. Now on a Friday, it's just a rough pub full of screams and shouts and alcohol pops and snogging overlooking the war memorial. And in the middle of this party, Sam descended from his wheezing bus. As he stepped onto the pavement, a beer-soaked huddle of rowdy youth rumbled by. Sam got sideswiped with no intent and was on his backside in a moment. Only one person heard his cursing and saw his fall. Billy turned back for a moment to look at the old bugger on the floor. He saw a bundle of a man rocking like a downed rhino. Billy nearly moved towards him, but more important business dragged him off. Sam thinks the kitchen looks like shit. But why should ten years of tenants care? Then the 
pain rotting his guts doubles him up and he holds on for his passing more frequent now. He tries to breathe deeply as he's been told and wondered if he should care either. Sam slaps his face and finishes his lukewarm tea. The clarion is a different kind of place in the day. Fag smoke still seeps from the brickwork and the nicotine ceiling drips on your head. But there are only cards and dominoes, clack slap, and a clearing of throats and mumbles. Sam nudges in for a pint and after his order takes in the room. He feels no threat as cracked faces look his way, wondering. There's nobody he knows, but there is a familiar taste in the air. He asks the barman about a name, anybody who does a bit of painting and stuff, and a croak comes from amidst the dominoes. Billy's your boy. Billy. Billy Michael. With nods and grunts in agreement, the domino king continues, give me your address and I'll let him know. Right, says Sam. Clack slap. In the front room of his house, Sam opens one of a few boxes he'd sent ahead. He puts a photo on the mantelpiece. It's a photo frame of him and Betty. The one good thing he had, taken away too soon. Sam carefully unwraps some cotton wool and takes out a gold tie pin encrusted with turquoise and pearls. He sticks it into the frame, steps back, and looks at it carefully as the doorbell rings. Sam invites Billy in. You look familiar. I might be, said Billy. Drink? Ta. The beers go down well as Billy looks around at the work in front of him and Sam looks around at Billy. Sam rubs his own head and asks Billy if he gets cold in the winter with a shaved head. And Billy stares for a moment and breaks a smile and says, Oh, I usually wear a cap. Quite fancy that myself, fresh in the wind, and I don't have too far to go, says Sam, rubbing his own head once more. Do you shave it yourself? Cheaper, says Billy. What I want, Billy, is a basic paint job right through. Clean it up. What do you think? No problem. Colours? Oh, keep it simple. Magnolia, then. Money? A hundred. You'll get more than that. A day. Christ. So Sam learns quickly how all those things that seem not to have changed have changed a lot. And this mountain top was, of course, a part of the world and how much of an old fart he had become thinking back to when and how and how it was so lovely. Bollocks! <laughs> so the deal was done and it would take a couple of weeks and Billy would start the next day. But it's a Sunday, says Sam. When I get going, I get going, says Billy, and I got nothing better to do. Fair enough, says Sam. And they take two more beers as Billy looks at the photo on the mantelpiece. Nice looking lady. Yes, said Sam. You married? Billy pauses but doesn't pry. No. Kids? Around? Look after the mind? I do, says Billy. Good for you, says Sam. Sam gets 50 quid out of his wallet and some house keys from his pocket. Here's a sub and the keys and there'll be more for materials by Monday. No problem, says Billy, as Sam puts the money and keys into Billy's hands. Sam looks into Billy's eyes and Billy does the same to Sam. Sam smiles and says, See you tomorrow. And so you will says Billy as he crosses to the door. Billy looks back at Sam for a moment and nods. The days pass well and the house starts to look like a home and Billy works on and Sam moves around and new friends are found that went with the old and the world turns warmly in Sam's fearsome last days. And laughter is found to take the edge off, in the pub mostly and old yarns taken apart and represented with other views. Billy is hard at it when a couple of head cases come a-calling. 
Craig and Chewie creep up on Billy while the radio plays loudly in his ears. And Craig grabs Billy tight around the throat. Everything you've got or I'll break your fucking neck. Billy moves fast with feet and hands and lashes wildly to some ferocious effect. And through the pain, Craig screams, Christ, Billy is a fucking joke. Some joke, you ass. Only having a laugh and you buggered my arm. Billy looks at the idiot pair, a bit younger than himself. Those peripheral boys on the edge of every group, not quite having what it takes and dreaming of greater deeds of the wrong kind of fame. What do you twats want? Just saying hello, says Chewy, rubbing his leg and trying to smile. Well, I, why don't I believe you, says Billy. Cup of tea, was Chewy's reply. Clear up this mess, says Billy, as he goes out the back to put the kettle on. Who's this place anyway, says Craig. Oh, some old boy, shouts Billy from the kitchen. Anything worth nicking? And Billy walks back in with the mugs. Yeah, right. Now have your teas and fuck off. Billy's shopping from cost cutters wasn't special, but he eats okay. He's not a tin and packet man, as he's taken time to learn. To stay fit for his Friday nights, he's learned to look after himself properly. His social worker thinks Billy has problems a lifetime won't work out because Billy likes to fight. He's not mad or uncontrolled. On a Friday, he's very controlled indeed. He just likes the challenge and the pain. He's no different to anybody else, except in the fact that the pain doesn't matter, or that it does, but in a good way, like Christ on the cross. Catch him right and he can talk for hours on the subject. But right now, all he wants is to go home with his shopping. Then Sam pops up in the street. All right, Sam. No. What? How's it going? Oh, good. Be finished in a couple of days. So what do I owe you? Says Sam. Oh, I'll be about four days, says Billy. Well, that's a start comes the reply. But you owe me much more than that. How come, says Billy, as Sam presses in on him, where's the pin? What pin? The tie pin on the fort oar. Oh, that. Is it lost? I haven't lost it for 30 fucking years, you shit! Screams Sam, spitting in Billy's face. Sam lunges and lashes angrily and Billy steps back and in again and holds the old man easily and tight and Sam cries with frustration and his breathing runs out. Billy releases Sam slowly and Sam slumps to the wall. Sam looks up and says, I'm disappointed, Billy. There's only the sound of breathing and then Billy turns home for his tea. So am I, he says. Later that evening, there's a knock on Sam's door and a young lad stands there shaking. Jesus Christ, you should have that scene too, says Sam, as the boy's face moves with a throbbing blue-black. What happened? Fell over, says Craig. So come in and sit down and I'll get you a cup of tea, says Sam. Craig holds out his hand and says, I found this and somebody said it was yours. Sam takes the tie pin from Craig's palm and looks into the swollen eyes for quite some time and Craig twists awkwardly, just wanting to be gone. Very kind. Thank you. That's okay, grunts Craig to the front of the closing door. Billy is sitting at the bar, staring at the bottom of his glass, and Sam slides in beside him and quickly orders two pints. Billy studies a mark on the wall. 
as Sam takes a breath and drinks. I'm old, I'm prejudiced, and I'm a prat. Billy looks at the fresh pint in front of him. You've done a good job there, Billy. You've worked hard. I want you to finish. Billy drinks long and sets the pint down. First thing tomorrow, leave the money on the table, says Billy quietly. OK. And so, says Sam. Billy turns to look at Sam for the first time. What do you see? The worst. Billy smiles and turns back to the bar. But I see the worst in everybody, continues Sam. It's like looking at myself. It's my job. I'm a bastard and that's the way I operate. Look at this lot in here. I see the worst in all of them. Billy laughs. <laughs> but I'm still here. And they don't bother me a toss. Tough old bugger, aren't you? Maybe once. Now it's just one foot in front of the other. And if they did kick the shit out of me, who'd notice? That's not self-pity, Billy, that's fact. And I wouldn't give a rat's ass. Billy looks at Sam carefully. Your eyes say different he says. And Sam turns away and says, there may be some things. And Sam hides in the depths of his beer for a short breath. Too late for me, Billy. But well, what about you? Billy just stares away. No? Right, says Sam. I'm an interfering old dickhead with nothing else to do, and if I can upset somebody along the way, then better still. And with a small twinkle in his eye, Sam finishes his drink. Billy runs his finger around the rim of his glass and says to no one in particular, <clears throat> Clouds of affection from our younger eyes conceal that emptiness which age descries. What? Nothing, and I'm pissed, says Billy. Sam twists on the stool to adjust his crotch and his discomfort, and Billy mumbles, Secrets, Sam, secrets. Right, says Sam as he stands up. Billy watches Sam swinging out into the night as the barman leans over. Old farts, pain in the ass. Yeah, right, says Billy quietly. <laughs>